This person died in 2014 at age 85. She was the United States ambassador to Ghana from 1974 to 1976. Ooh, Barbara Bush? Not Barbara Bush. At a time when operations for cancer were shrouded in secrecy, she held a news conference in her hospital room after her mastectomy to discuss her experience and to urge women discovering breast lumps not to sit at home and be afraid. Oh my gosh, I feel like I should know who this person is. Trying to destigmatize breast cancer. Is it Nancy Reagan? It's not Nancy Reagan. In 1950, she became a prominent Republican fundraiser. I don't know. I'm trying to think. From 1935 to 1939, she was the most popular movie star in America. Oh, my goodness. A 30s movie star who was also a Republican fundraiser. (laughs) I have no clue. (laughs) Was it like Shirley Temple? Today's dead celebrity is Shirley Temple. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. It really is? It really is. Oh, honey, you're a perfect lady. You're a regular guy. Oh, thanks. We We should be together, together, you you and I. Welcome to Famous and Gravy. I'm Michael Osborne. My name is Amit Kapoor. And on this show, we go through a series of categories about multiple aspects of a famous person's life. We want to figure out the things in life that we would actually desire and ultimately answer a big question. Would I want that life? Today, Shirley Temple Black. Died 2014, age 85. First line of the obituary. Shirley Temple Black, who as a dimpled, precocious, and determined little girl in the 1930s sang and tap danced her way to a height of Hollywood stardom and worldwide fame that no other child has reached, died on Monday at her home in Woodside, California. She was 85. Amit. They just stopped? They didn't... They didn't get into the second half of anything. Not even the second half, the, like, even the second quarter. Yeah, they didn't get to the last three quarters. Which were tremendous, as we'll be talking about. Yeah, couldn't believe it. So when you and I decided to do this episode... I was thinking, oh, good, two middle-aged men talking about a child actor from the 1930s. Obviously, there's going to be plenty of wisdom to extract from this conversation. And then you get into her life, and holy shit. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. And yeah, we'll get there. But like, there's a lot missing from this. I mean, it is what she is famous for. It is what she's famous for, but it doesn't nod to any of the other accomplishments. It also, for me, misses one of the big categories of fame, the drink. Yeah. I think the drink has to be mentioned in the first line of the obituary. And so I was going to ask, I was thinking of other people who have a drink. Her and Arnold Palmer. I mean, a non-alcoholic drink. Sure. So her and Arnold Palmer are all I can come up with. Was Harvey Wallbanger a person? Must have been. (laughs) With that name, Tom Collins. I mean, there's other drinks named after people. But shouldn't it have belonged in here? I mean, even if it is a comma splice of, and will be forever remembered for both her accomplishments as a child actress as well as a non-alcoholic drink served around the world. I agree. Because, I mean, at least that speaks to something lasting. Right. Regardless, let's look at the words that we had. We had precocious. How did they use that? Dimpled, precocious, and determined little girl. I'm on board with all of that. Yeah. I mean, that's That's fine. uh, Never having been able to sit through an entire Shirley Temple movie before, I tried. I couldn't do it. This is an accurate description. I don't like a little girl, even though that's exactly what she was. I just, there's something about that phrasing and an obituary. So I think the use of the phrase little girl with the omission of the woman she became is a disservice. Yes. Even though her later in life accomplishments are less well known, the immortalizing her as a little girl of the silver screen in the 1930s is a kind of, not just disservice, but it's almost trapped in a time capsule or something, right? Yes. And then they said whatever, sung, tap dance, saluted. Did they say say salute? They say height of Hollywood stardom and worldwide fame that no other child has reached. So there is a sort of superlative accomplishment in there. If you go to Wikipedia, if you look up child star and go to Wikipedia, it's her picture there. She is the literal poster child 
for a child star. I'm sure the rest of the obituary got into it, but the whole reason we do this category is the first line tends to be a a pretty damn good synopsis. Yeah. And they didn't do it. It seems like you're leading towards a low score, which for you is less than seven. This is true. <laughs> yeah, this might be my all-time low. I don't like, I just, I, I need some discussion of her life after the age of like 12. Yeah. Even just a reference. So I'm, I don't like it. I'm going three. Wow. Yeah. I think I'm going five, which all your points are taken. There's no question that this diminishes the rest of her life after she's out of the Hollywood limelight, even though she's never really entirely out of it. But it's the thing we know her for. I'm pissed the drink isn't in there, and I'm pissed that the, the ambassadorships and the public service and you know dedication to political causes is not there. But at least for the thing that we remember her for and why she's famous and why she's in here— it, it, it's encapsulated, and it's the right verbiage, too. Dimpled, precocious, and determined. And then I do think the fame that no other child has reached, that from 1935 to 39, she was the biggest star. I mean, we don't remember most of the stars from that age, but more important than Clark Gable, Errol Flynn, and Charlie Chaplin. Like I think, actually, because of everything that's said in the first half of the obituary line, that doesn't actually land and sound as elevated as it is, that is an unbelievable accomplishment. She's on the Mount Rushmore, if not the president of the Child Actors Club. So I give it a five. Okay. It's kind of low. It's, it's middle for me, but it's got some things that are working. Yeah. All right. Category two, five things I love about you. Here, Amit and I work together to come up with five reasons why we uh, admire this person and they're worth talking about on the show. Do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I can go. Yeah, I'm going to go big because this was one of the most surprising things to me, but I loved it. She was a board member of like extremely high profile corporations. Yeah. So she was on the boards of Disney, which we can see a parallel perhaps there. Sure. But she was also on the boards of Del Monte and Bank of America. As well as the uh, National Wildlife Federation. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, she was a leader, which... I'm not sure anybody knew that about her. Yeah, but to be on the board of directors of a public company, much less these are, you know, probably Fortune 500, if not Fortune 1000 companies, is a huge leadership role. It's a huge crowning achievement. And what you're doing is essentially being the stewards and strategic decision maker of billions of dollars. And then ultimately in people's own wealth, right? You mean stockholders? And- yeah, but stockholders are everyone. Like every right, pension right. fund and every everyone that has the gift of having savings in their life has stakes in this. That's incredible. Yeah. Have you served on any big boards before? No. I mean, I've been on the board of a nonprofit. Yeah. But no, nothing else. I've been asked a few times, and I've volunteered, and most of the time those opportunities have kind of flitted away. And I'm not sure if it's me or not. Maybe you got to build it up. I guess so. I don't even know if I really want to be board material. Do you want to be board material? Yeah, I think so. Because I, I, I have been lucky enough to present to boards yeah. in some previous jobs. Yeah. And I kind of look across the room and I was like, yeah, I wouldn't mind being in one of those chairs. So I guess what I'm, why I'm asking is why is this a thing you love about her? It speaks to her leadership qualities, but is this something you aspire to in your life, to serve on more boards? I suppose so. I'm not sure what the path is to get there. Yeah. And then it's just, it's so contrary to the first line of the obituary. Yeah. It's so contrary to what I thought this show about Shirley Temple would be about. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, and it's something I didn't learn until the lead up to this episode. It's really good. All right. Can I take the second one? Yes. Okay. The drink. I'm sorry. I want a drink named after me. That it, that lives in eternity, possibly. I think so. Yeah, I that, think that's that great. is pretty desirable. <laughs> I think Great. I'll have a somebody pulls up to a bar and I'm not drinking tonight. I'll have a Michael Osborne, please. Which is? I don't know. I was thinking about that because I knew you'd ask. I, probably something with root beer, but I don't know what pairs with root beer that hasn't happened before. Root beer and club soda? Yeah, maybe a diluted root beer. I kind of like that. Diluted? I, mean, I probably. <laughs> the way I heard you say it was diluted root beer. Yeah, diluted. Like a, like a root beer that. <laughs> a root beer um, that's lost its way? Yeah, yeah. That, or that just, you know, does. does nonsensical? Um, yeah, believes in something that doesn't exist. Yeah, a diluted root beer. Actually, that'd be fine too. We need to, I want to just, I learned some things about the drink. Uh, yeah, so, let's talk more about it. So the, the origin story, from my understand, was what was the name of the bar? In- well, so the Times has this bar, or I think a famous restaurant called the Brown Derby in yes. Hollywood. I saw other accounts that apparently. Apparently, there is a restaurant in Hawaii that claims to have invented it. So there's some dispute about its origin. Okay. 
let's just go with the Hollywood one. Yeah. So it was apparently invented by this bartender so she could drink something because she's a star and she's in these, like, adult environments. Yeah. So that was interesting. Even though she doesn't like it. That was the other thing. She yeah. said it was too sweet. Yeah. So she, like, didn't even like it. Somebody tried capitalizing on it. Yeah. So somebody tried him. bottling it up and using the name, and she sued. She said, you are not using that a celebrity. The only thing they have is their name. Yeah. And you cannot take that from me. Which is great. That's desirable, too. I, I mean, agree. I, I like that. She never had owned ownership over the drink, but she does claim her name, and, and it's she doesn't want it on the side of cans. And it's immortalized. Yeah. Yeah. I So so I think all of that fits into my number two thing. Yeah. Well, the last thing I want to add about the drink, which I loved too, is so her married name became Shirley Temple Black. Right. And so there was this twist on the drink that came to be after that, that a Shirley Temple Black includes dark rum. Oh, that's perfect. Yes, I thought that was wonderful. <laughs> and what a great game. transition from just like talking about a child star into later now being an adult. Yeah. Okay, what do you got for number three? Let's go breast cancer. Yeah, I had that one too. Yeah, she I beat, mean, not, not the breast cancer, but the public disclosure of it. And the beating of it. And the beating of it. In 1972, that alone is impressive, it's certainly desirable. Yeah, to beat cancer and to destigmatize breast cancer. Yes, yeah, so you talk about that, the destigmatization. So she has a press conference in the hospital room and that she discloses that she had a mastectomy at a time when this was not discussed publicly. That having breast cancer was, if not stigmatized, wasn't discussed in public. And she, my understanding is, is encouraging self-examination for women. Yes. Why was it stigmatized in boobs. 1972? Just because it deals with the... I think it's dealing with boobs, yeah. Yeah. We're very uncomfortable with boobs. I think in America, we're, I think that's all it is. It's private parts. I think you could talk about having you know shoulder cancer or brain cancer or whatever, but if you get anywhere near... You know, the sexual organs, yeah. you know, oh, we can't, oh, oh, you know. It's funny. And what's stigmatized now? Mental health, right? Yeah. And it's the exact opposite. It's because it's not parts. Although, that don't you think that's changing? Uh, it is, but I don't think it's changing enough. I think there's a long road. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, that's a great number three. Can I take number four? Please. I think, uh, you know, this is where I want to talk about her experience as a diplomat. Yeah. So three ambassadorships or three sort of diplomatic posts. The first was as a U.S. delegate to the United Nations under Nixon in 1969. She was the ambassador to Ghana from 1974 to 76. And this is like, I mean, Ghana in the mid-70s, my understanding is this is not a nothing post, that one of the things she had to do in that job was secure U.S. interests for mineral rights in Ghana and make sure that there wasn't some sort of communist socialist takeover. She had actual work to do. And then she was the ambassador to Czechoslovakia from 1989 to 92. And this is at the end of the Cold War during the time of the Velvet Revolution. And by all accounts, did an awesome job. All of this gets sort of started in 69 when Henry Kissinger overhears her talking about, I think, Liberia. Namibia. Is was it what Namibia? I read it. Okay, yeah. But he's like, how the hell does Shirley Temple know anything about Namibia? And then she has this whole other career. And not only does she have these diplomatic posts, she also runs an ambassador training program or participates in one where she's like teaching people what to do if a hostage situation happens. Yeah. A fucking unbelievable, right? Surely yeah. goddamn temple? I had no idea. Yeah. I could not believe this. I mean, this really, this floored me. I, I mean, and what is, what, what is leadership in that realm, right? It's, it's part politics, but it's a lot of social skills. Yes. Required. Well, and that's what I, that, that's where I think she brought something to it, but also did tremendously well in navigating all the other parts. She presents incredibly well as an adult woman. I yeah. saw an interview she did with Larry King in the late 80s around the time that her autobiography came out. And like, she has like authority. She's a boss, man. It's incredible. And I did not expect that of Shirley Temple because I have this firmly cemented in my mind, you know, the curly hairs and black and white picture. And then what is your sort of knowledge and experience of people who work in the foreign service? I have very direct knowledge. So my grandfather, my mother's father, was an Indian diplomat. So oh, wow. he was an ambassador from India to several nations. No shit. Yeah. And so my mother actually grew up in a mix between Uganda and Sweden and the Philippines. But where that means something to me is he, without a doubt in our family, was the most tremendous, remarkable man just liked by every child and adult, just 
emanated wisdom. Wow. And so that being a role model to me throughout my entire life, the idea of foreign service and ambassadorship is incredibly desirable to me. Yeah. I've had it occasion to meet a couple of former ambassadors, not many, and they all have that quality. Wow. That's really cool, man. Yeah. All right. That's number three for me. No, that was number four. All right. That's number four for and me. And I think, to be honest, Michael, I think you like... Just just between that, I, I think we covered most of mine. I can take a number five, but it really is part of the number four that we just talked about. I, so if you have one that's a deviation from that, I think you should do it. I do. I, uh, I'll, I'll say first in a, in a racial dance on the silver screen, we think, between a black person and a white person, which was Bill Bojangles Robinson. Yes. And yeah. you think that's desirable? Yeah, I think it's desirable. I mean, there's and it, so in the autobiography, Mr. Bojangles, after you know, named after the Jerry Jeff song, Bill Robinson and Shirley Temple are friends. This was not some let's just put these two on the screen. They're in m- many movies together, but like he shows up in big moments in her life. I mean, he dies when she's still fairly young. Yeah, but, um, but the presentation of it was just so kind of like I don't know. It wouldn't. It wouldn't go today. What are you trying to say? I don't know. Here? There was kind of like a minstrelsy yeah. thing to it. Yeah. But for, you're right. Like, if you put it in just strict context of 1936 or whatever, it is revolutionary. That's right. And I think it's presented as something that should not be so controversial. And I think that that's how America has had to slow step into more and more racial justice. Like, this country takes itty bitty steps, incremental two steps forward, one step back. But the the presentation of this little girl with this black man in 1936 is not controversial. It works on the screen. Yeah. And that's a step forward. So right. it's it's an accomplishment to me. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's the very beginning of something much, much greater. Right. And also, I guess to that same point, not just that relationship, but the whole thing, her whole career, they attribute her success to the fact that it was Depression-era America. Right. You know, that you had a lot of people in despair, and she was the uplifter right. of that. So I think we've got our five. What do we get? We got corporate boards, uh, the Shirley Temple drink, life as a diplomat, breast cancer, and then social justice. And on the life of the diplomat, let me add, she was the first and only woman so far to represent the United States to... Czechoslovakia, or later Czech Republic or Slovakia. Is that right? Yeah. To this day, she's the only woman who's... I believe so. All right. That's a pretty bomber five list. Yeah. Okay. Category three, Malkovich Malkovich. This category is named after the movie Being John Malkovich, in which people can take a portal into John Malkovich's mind, and they can have a front row seat to his experiences. The point is to imagine what memories or experiences might be interesting. Why don't you go first? Yeah, I will. So I think every Malkovich I've done so far has been somewhat positive. Mm. But we rewatched Malkovich recently. <laughs> yeah, it's you good. know, and it's not always that, right? There's not some, at all. And so I thought about it, and it's, you know, what do you want a front row seat to? Not necessarily what do you want to live through. So the, the one I have is, you know, there was a lot of rumors and headlines about who she actually was when she was a child star. Right. You know, there were people claiming that she's actually a 30-year-old with dwarfism. and That and, was a big rumor. That was like a no-bullshit rumor. Yeah, so she, and she was getting harassed. She had a bodyguard. Yes. But, you know, certain fans or non-fans, like they were trying to expose her and like, you know, saying that this child wig with the curly hair and everything was all a front and there's really a 30-year-old underneath. So she would actually like go into public and people would pull at her hair. Yeah. Try to like rip off the wig and expose her for actually being an adult. That is bonkers. It is bonkers. Can you imagine that? As somebody ripping at your hair? Ripping at everything and just being like, you're not who you say you are, but you know who you are. It's yeah. just got to be bizarre. Yeah. What do you think that felt like for her? I mean, she was so tiny, for one. Like, it's hard for me to place myself in a child's mind. Well, she's precocious and determined and dimpled. Yeah, so I think what was going through her mind was, well, A, fucking stop it. Yeah. But also, B, like, people care this much. Yeah. There's no way that I can be me, you know? Like, I'm that un believable in a certain way that this is the lengths that they're going to. So at some point in this conversation, you and I need to talk about how she's not fucked up in the way that most 
child actors or actresses. This is a trope. This is a thing. This is well understood as Holly, the Hollywood machinery will grind a child and screw them up for life. Totally. I found an excellent Atlantic article that really got at this question. Is Did she come through relatively unscathed because she was a child star in a different culture? And a different time when the sort of, I don't know, drugs were not as common and America was not as divided. And just less media, period. Right. Or was there something about her that came through relatively unscathed? And the article kind of leans in the latter direction, that she is precocious. She has a self-awareness. She also has parents who are, a mother in particular, who are maybe not always making the best decisions, but are like parenting and actively parenting and making sure she's schooled and making sure she understands the relationship between her and her fans. In that interview I referenced earlier with Larry King, he sort of asked the question, why aren't you fucked up? I mean, he doesn't say it in that way, but basically she says, it's because of my mother. I have a wonderful mother and that I do think parenting can, if not totally guard and protect you from the Hollywood machinery, it can at least buffer it. Yeah. And that, and I think what the stories we've been exposed to lately is the exact opposite, that the yeah. parents, you know, there's a lot of blame placed on the parents. Yeah. You look at the whole Britney Spears thing that's happened lately. Right. And all of that. Yeah. But going back to my Malkovich, so, you know, that's, I, I kind of want to see that just through a portal. If we're going to take it further into desirability of living through, it's that you are so superior that you are unbelievable. Yeah. And that people actually don't believe you. See, but that's the thing is that I think these two things are connected because, you know, can a child be elevated and be, you know, placed on a pedestal and admired and become the biggest star in Hollywood so much so that you generate conspiracy theories about whether or not you're even real or not and and have that not fuck with your head? Most adults can't seem to handle the burden of fame, it seems like. I can't even take a compliment. Right. (laughs) I mean, neither. Me neither. And so... I don't know, but somehow she made it through. Well, that's a good one. All right. So yours. All right. I've got one. I need you to bear with me for a second because I'm going to go through a long list of ones I didn't choose. Okay. Because her life, especially in the early days, was pretty fucking fascinating. She meets Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart shows up on her doorstep and becomes Shirley Temple's hero. And then Amelia Earhart dies. I wonder about that. She meets Albert Einstein, who tries to connect with her over like, yeah, I too struggle with arithmetic. And she's like, whatever, Albert. She gets to know J. Edgar Hoover very well. It's a lifelong friendship. The FBI is very involved in protecting her throughout her years in Hollywood. She also played croquet with Orson Welles, who asked, did you fall for the War of the Worlds thing? And Shirley Temple says, no, I did not. Apparently, they didn't like each other very much. She meets F. Scott Fitzgerald, who has a movie that she's going to do for her that ended up not happening. When she was 19, she's in a movie with Ronald Reagan, and right before a kissing scene with Ronald Reagan, she finds out she's pregnant, and then she also was asked for an autograph while having contractions for her first child in an elevator. None of those are my Malkovich moments, but I had to bring them all up. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed that. I did. Okay, here's what I got. She ran for uh, a House seat in California in the Republican primary. She was a lifelong Republican, and she lost to Pete McClaskey, who, by the way, he's still alive. This is in 1967. Shirley Temple does not win that primary. Yeah. Um, she's trying this to is become... before the Kissinger Correct. interaction. Correct. Yeah. But same year. And she loses an election. I wonder what it feels like to lose an election, especially after you've had a successful Hollywood career and you're trying something new. You're trying to define your adult life. Being part of an election just sounds awful because... It is a kind of popularity contest. Which we talked about a lot on Ross Perot. Yeah. It's so binary, you know? You either are accepted or not. Now, at this point, there had not been a woman California representative in 1967. So maybe losing it is buffered by that. I'm curious to know how hard she's working to say, I had these 20 years in Hollywood. People are going to know me for forever for my Hollywood career and for this pink drink. And now I'm really trying to get into a public service and then to lose an election. I just wonder how that feels. I mean, I'm sure it's defeating, but one of the things I admire about her is her resiliency. And I want to know how long it took to bounce back. To bounce back from that. Yeah. So that's my Malkovich. Okay, good. Category four, how many marriages? Also, how many kids? And is there anything public about these relationships? 
I'll go through this quickly. Two marriages, John Agar, I think is how you say it, A-G-A-R, 1945 to 1949. Shirley was 17 when they got married. He, which, was the, which was okay at the time? I don't know. What I read, I mean, I think her mom was not psyched about it. And they actually got engaged right before her 17th birthday. He was in the service, and it was there was a kind of World War II. He was like, going away, let's get this going thing. He's 24. He's seven years older than her and is the older brother of a high school friend. So as she, around 12, around, you when know, she the time she's- in the Westlake school. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So she meets this man at some dance. Uh, that marriage lasts four years, produces one child. Sounds like he was a, an alcoholic. And in her autobiography, there is a moment where he hits her. Or he strikes her. So, I mean, and he went on to have kind of a Hollywood career, a pretty pathetic one. Yeah, I mean, it looks like he almost used her to launch his own to get himself yeah, like, further into Hollywood. I, yeah, that's interesting. I, I mean, that what the way it reads in her book, it's more like he did like her, he was attracted to her, but the marriage sours almost instantaneously. He just did not know what it would be like to be married to a child star, and. She's still acting at this point, but the roles have really started to taper off. I mean, once she gets to age 12, she's no longer, you know, banking for Hollywood the same way. Yeah. This is another thing I want to talk about, actually, and this hadn't come up yet. One of the things that I've really struggled with as you and I have been approaching this conversation, this episode, is kind of the like, question of agency, right? She's a child star. These decisions are made by her parents, she listens to her mom and dad, and she listens to the directors on set, and she learns how to act. And she's actually really good. She she can cry on cue, and she learns her lines. Like, she takes this seriously as a professional. But I don't know when in life we become re responsible for our decisions. When you're a young child, obviously, all decisions are made on your behalf. And then when you're an adult, you're expected to be responsible for your behavior. But it, it's a transition that spans over many years from somewhere in adolescence into emerging adulthood. So it's just been on my mind if this conversation is about desirability and life choices, if that's what Famous and Gravy is really all about. I don't know when to say these are the life choices Shirley Temple is making and, and therefore there's something to be learned from it. But having the agency to get out of it and retaining custody of the child. That's right. And somewhere in there is, I think, actually where her taking on the responsibilities of womanhood, like, happens. I mean, actually, in some ways happens before. But, like, that's the thing that about, about being a child star is that she's got to assume all this responsibility at a much younger age than most children do. Yeah. The second marriage, Charles Black, who she gets engaged to within 60 days of finalizing her divorce from John. That's in 1950. They are married until 2005 when he dies. She was 22. Charles was 31. He dies when she's 77, and she never remarried. Two children in that second marriage, one of whom goes on to play for the grunge band The Melvins. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that I, wild? Yeah. <laughs> I, I couldn't loved, believe that. I loved that. Yeah. So that's it. I think this basically gets a high score for me, Amit. Yeah, I, I, you know, I would agree. The first marriage was a mistake. And the second marriage happens fast, but it's like the love of her life, and she stays committed to it. And she marries him in 1950. That's around the time she retires from Hollywood. Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to it, right? Like, yeah. that was kind of the beginning of Shirley Temple Black, like right. literally. Right. But she, it was when she left acting and made a, a huge name for herself elsewhere. Yeah. One thing about Charles Black, he'd never seen any of her movies. Like, I heard he seemed that. totally yeah. ignorant of who she was, and it seemed pretty clear that she needed somebody like that. Shall we move on? Yep. All right, category five, net worth. 30 mil. 30 million. What's interesting about that, because this I got curious about. So her parents, like, basically squandered the Hollywood money. So all the money she makes from, like, 1931 to 1940-ish ultimately 1950, but until she has decision-making power over her finances, mostly gets squandered. It all goes to the family. They have a nice house and they have a good life and she gets a good education and all that. But she should have had millions waiting for her and it winds up being something like 60,000. So this 30 million is almost all the Shirley Temple black fortune. It's her work as a diplomat and you know, well, her, diplomats don't, that's not a paying. Yeah, but I think well. she's, I mean, she's, well, she's also serving on the boards. And I think she is also doing some speaking events here and there. 
But the thing I'm trying to draw attention to is that 30 million ought to be not considered part of her early fortune. That That is adult earned money. So your understanding was there's, there was not a lot of royalties and even of the merchandising from those. Correct. Even though there's Shirley Temple dolls and dishware, I think that there is some of that. But there, there's also some shitty contracts signed with the Hollywood studios in the early years. I think that gets corrected later, but the money is not managed well. This is not about her next level Hollywood stardom. Speaking as a is a moneymaker. Like I've been in positions before that we have to, you know, sort of hire these well known speakers. Yeah. It's a lot of money that sometimes you get paid for forty five minutes of of giving a keynote. Yeah, absolutely. No, I've I've it's not in this episode, but I I desire that. I'd love to just I'd like to get paid to talk if that's not clear from this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall we go on? Yes. All right. Category six, Simpsons, Saturday Night Live or Hall of Fame. This category is a measure of how famous a person is. We include both guest appearances on SNL or The Simpsons, as well as impersonations. Okay, never appeared on The Simpsons, but there is an episode that features a character called Vicky Valentine. Yes, I remember that very well. Loosely based on Shirley Temple's life. Vicky Valentine grows up to have a big ego and a competitive edge. And the Simpsons showrunners approach Shirley Temple and said, would you voice this? And she said, fuck off. And that's quoted several places. She apparently did say, fuck off. Really? Yeah. I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe that rumor just got copy-pasted on a several articles. Yeah, well so, done, Shirley. Yeah. Uh, it, it was actually on one of those like famous people who declined to appear on The Simpsons yes. kinds of lists out there. That's what I found for The Simpsons. And SNL? So I found that she was parodied by Lorraine Newman in the early cast in 1976. This is when Shirley Temple is ambassador to Ghana. And it, this is, I think, a joke about her ambassadorship. I couldn't find the video for this. It's behind a paywall. There might have been others. I imagine it's something like her with the curls and all, like, it's totally. sitting in Ghana. Yeah. And then she has a Hollywood Walk of Fame. She got their star in 1960. Yeah, and she has the, the, the handprints. She's famous. Yeah. Can I ask a question real quick? Mm-hmm. Did you know her as a drink first or as an actress first? Actress. I knew her as a drink first. Really? Yeah. I, I Somebody ordered me a Shirley Temple when I was five or six. I was like, this is fantastic. And yeah. then later I learned it was a person. It's sort of like the Vidal Sassoon thing. I couldn't believe there was actually a human behind it. Oh, really? Thing. Yeah. I remember, I hear the name, the first thing I think of is, is Good Chip Lollipop. I hear the name, the other thing I, I hear is, uh, Shirley, you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. All right. Category seven. Over under. In this category, we look at the generalized life expectancy for the year this person was born to see if they beat the house odds and as a measure of grace. Life expectancy for women in 1928, the year she was born, was 58.3. She died age 85. Well done, Shirley. Well done, Shirley. Crushed it. She did, Uh, even though she was a lifelong smoker. Saw that. And she also, like I said earlier, she presents well. She aged gracefully. Yeah, she was very articulate. Uh, yeah. She was very attractive. Yes. Too, throughout. Yeah. She held on to the grace. And I mean, the whole story is graceful, I think. I think so. Uh, it's time for a word from our sponsor. So let's take a break. So, Michael, we each do our own set of research as we prepare for these shows. Mm -hmm. I notice you always reference a biography and you have like a paperback biography with you as we come to studio. Yeah. So I am to assume that you're getting these from some online mega mart. Is that correct? No, not at all. The first thing I do when you and I decide on our next dead celebrity is I go and find out, is there a biography on this person? And is that biography available at half price books? There's a store right up the street from me, an actual brick and mortar store where I can walk in. When I go there to find out, do they have a biography for our next dead celebrity? But I always wind up picking up more books. I go through the children's section. I'm a sucker for a good page turner, so I go through the murder mystery section. They also have rare collections. They have signed stuff. I don't know how this sounds to you, but I actually, I love the smell of half price books. It's got that old book smell. I do. I like that too. Isn't that a great smell? Yeah. And you know what? Half Price Books is currently celebrating 50 years of buying and selling books, movies, and music. There are more than 120 stores, and you can find out more about Half Price Books at hpb.com.
All right. At this point in our show, most of what we've learned is easily obtainable public information. We're going to transition and now start to imagine what it would have been like to have been this person. These are the more introspective categories on our show. First one is man in the mirror. Did she like her reflection? Amit. I'm going to go a slight no. Wow. Didn't yeah. expect that. She made a quote to Time Magazine once about her acting life, and she said something to the effect of, I always think of her as the little girl. That's not me. So referring to herself, like those first 20 years were just not even her, yeah. but it was somebody else. I think that's confusing. I think it's difficult to have your face as a child plastered all over the world, and you look in the mirror and you sort of extract yourself there's an absence of totality yeah. in it. And I think anytime we see our own reflection, yes, we are seeing ourselves in the here and now, but we are also bringing together uh, sort of all we know about ourselves and all we live through. And if she has to basically third person herself for that beginning of her life, I just don't know that it's an easy glance. It's a very strong and very thoughtful answer, I got to say. It's very hard to watch videos of her and not kind of look for the little girl whose likeness we're so familiar with. I actually have one other thing I want to add to that. I don't know if you have this experience. When I see pictures of myself, like from last night, for example, I'm always like, I look that old? My mind's image of who I am is a younger version of me. I'm not aware of my own aging. My brain, my mind's eye perception, my, my self-narrative hasn't caught up with what has happened to... 43-year-old Michael. I think that's everybody. You're probably right. But I, something about your answer to the Shirley Temple question made me think about, is it even harder for her where her likeness is mirrored back to her, the younger version of herself, all the time? Exactly. Yeah. I went, yes, I didn't make this complicated, but I like your answer. I think she's confident. There's a self-awareness there that, to me, lends itself to a yes to the man in the mirror. Mm -hmm. All right, next category, outgoing message. Like Man in the Mirror, we're wondering, did they like the sound of their own voice when they heard it on an answering machine or outgoing voicemail? Would they have recorded it themselves? I didn't think too much about it. I said yes. I, I think so, yes, and I think it's different than the reflection. Even though her voice as a child was just this, like this overly bubbly and squeaky yeah. type of thing, she was so articulate as an adult, and I think there's a difference there. You know, because when you look at yourself, you're not... Uh, it's different than hearing yourself. Oh, yeah, no. As you and I have been working on this show, the division between these two categories has grown for me. There are two very different questions about self-perception. Yeah. Okay, next category. Regrets, public or private? What we really want to know is what, if anything, kept this person awake at night? I think this is where I want to talk about some of the more complicated stuff. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Well, let me go through what I got on the public front. Okay. First, marriage. It's pretty clear. That was a mistake. Yep. I mentioned earlier some of the shitty contracts she signed with Fox in particular. Although she claims to have no resentment around her parents for mismanaging the money, which is sort of interesting. She didn't get the role of Dorothy in Wizard of Oz. When she was how old? Of an age where it would have made sense. Although I think, I can't remember in which direction it went. Because it's 1939, so I think they might have said you still look too young or you're not old enough. I can't remember, but the casting director said no. The other thing was, so Wizard of Oz was under MGM, which her contract with Fox ended, 20th Century Fox ended. She's also, by the way, we should have mentioned this, credited with saving 20th Century Fox. In the early 30s, that studio was in a state of major crisis, and she turns out to be a moneymaker. Anyway, so she didn't get the part of Dorothy. Might have been a regret. That's what I had on the public front. Did you have anything? Yeah, I mean, she did ultimately die of obstructive pulmonary disease, so maybe a life of smoking yeah. could have been one. The rest is more private, I think, the other ones that I have. So I don't know how and where to talk about it, but this is the thing that's been on my mind. She becomes pretty aware, and her parents do, that she is going to age out, mm -hmm. that her stardom as a child actress has a set limit and that she is going to in her puberty and start to become a woman. And as soon as she does, holy shit, the wolves descend. Like, I guess I have this story in my head that Hollywood wasn't always so such a corrupt, perverted machine. 
not true at all. Yeah. When she goes uh, over to MGM, which this is where I started to talk about this a second ago, there's Freed, I think his last name is. It's like Louis B. Mayer's right-hand man. She has a story with her and her mom where they get separated. Louis B. Mayer is talking to her mom, and this guy Freed is talking to her, and he exposes himself. I saw that. Yeah, and that. she just like straight up laughed because she'd never seen male anatomy before, and yeah. he throws her out. And then she and her mom are driving home. She tells her mother about this, which actually is, to me, the mark of great parenting, that she had comfort with her mother to, like, explain what happened. Yeah. And her mother says, yeah, well, Louis B. Mayer came on to me. So MGM was not a good place for them. Yeah. Here's the regret I came up with, the private one. This is totally speculative. But she is aware of the sexualization that and, and the kind of corruption that can happen to children in Hollywood, right? And she... She comes of age as a woman, still like in the limelight. And, and I wondered if she didn't ever think to herself, could I or should I have done more to protect the kids that are part of this industry? I see. I, I didn't see anywhere where she ever expressed that thought. And so I don't know. I, there's a part of me that that just wondered if she ever had that thought because Rather, she had that position, right? Exactly. Like, as you said, she is the president on Mount Rushmore of, of child action. Of child stardom. That's right. Yeah. And I don't know what, if anything, she could have done other than raise awareness. It's a big ask in a way, but it's my speculative regret on her life. Yeah. Because she's one of the few examples of just like psychologically sound child stars that we know of. Yeah. Or that I can think of, right? There's a lot of people, I guess those that exited, you know, we, we don't know their whole stories. I think that's right. Yeah. But I mean, like, fame has to fuck with you. People have very weird reactions. Shirley Temple, there was a woman who tried to kill her yeah. in 1939 who's like thought that she had stolen her daughter's soul, this deranged woman. FBI gets involved. It's it's not like in the 1930s, the bizarreness and the stalker thing around fame didn't exist. It very much did. And she was protected from it, but she wasn't ignorant of it. Yeah. What, I want to flip this a little bit. What would you do as a parent if, let's say, your daughter had an opportunity to be in a TV show? I, I, I'd put the kibosh on it immediately, man. I wouldn't even begin to walk down those, yeah, that, that road. Even if it's something she really wants to do. I say that. My wife, Allison, she's actually a wonderful actress. I've seen her on stage several times, and she had a, a real interest in acting at a young age. I remember talking to her about this, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think her parents gently steered her away from bigger opportunities. I think that's probably for the best, but I know Allison to this day kind of wonders like if I could have been guided in a healthy way towards a career in acting and film. You know, as I talk that out, that's probably where I would want to go with it. I love the theater and I don't think it's nearly as corrupting. And I think that if you become a great stage actress, then we'll deal with the Hollywood offers when we're ready for them. But I, that's where I would actually want to steer any kind of child prodigy things in, into like an institution that I have more comfort with. It's just strange to me, the whole idea of being a child actor or a child star, so even if you're a musician yeah. or whatnot. So, you know, in psychology, can I make the assumption that you've been to a therapist before? You can. Okay. So, you know, so much of, of all fields. And you're him. But go on, yeah. <laughs> Um, in all fields, they're looking for signs of childhood interrupted. Yeah. Right? And that's, you know, the foundation, at least, of a lot of problems that you develop as an adult. It seems almost impossible to not have an interrupted childhood if you have any degree of fame whatsoever. Yeah. It's so strange because I, I guess we need child actors, you know, if you're doing TV shows about families and stuff like that. So what I'm getting at is, you know, we use this category in the show about desirability with this person. Yeah. Right? But what I'm saying is, as a parent to anybody that has an opportunity for a child to to star in something, yeah. knowing all we know, how do yeah. they do it? I don't, I, I, I don't know. Personally, I, I, I would take pains to try and shield any child of any kind of major limelight, because I do think that 
their head can't handle it. And that part of the challenge of growing up is like having a healthy ego and not having certain forms of affirmation go to your head. People tell you how great you are or how smart you are or how talented you are. And if strangers are doing that to you at a young age, you said earlier, I can't even take a compliment. Most people can't. I think we have to learn as adults how to take a compliment. If you pile it on a, a kid at a young age, it just messes with them. So I don't know. I Major aversion. How could you not, as a responsible parent, have major aversion to it? At the same time, I don't know. If they're like good at a thing and it's like, you know what, there's a healthy pathway forward. You know, like everything, it's got to be a game time decision. Correct. And not everyone's born into this healthy middle class that we're born into right. also. Obviously. Right? Yeah, like yeah, if yeah. you've got a talented child and you can see an opportunity for that member of your family to earn money, that's a hard thing to pass up. You're right. I absolutely should cop to my privilege here. You know, and I wouldn't want to deny them an opportunity for uh, expression of a God-given talent. I don't have a clean answer. I'm thinking to, when we did the Peter Fonda episode, yeah. there was that whole Baron Trump thing. Yeah, Peter Fonda got derided for making a remark about, about Baron, Baron Trump, Trump being thrown into a cage at the border or whatever. Yeah, so we can't do that, but it's like they it's throwing him to this cage of this psychological cage of semi-stardom. All right, here's another thing I want to talk about that I think is more on topic with Shirley Temple. If she becomes the most popular Hollywood star in the Great Depression, and the, and the sort of happy narrative of her at least childhood stardom was that America needed this, what exactly did it need? Why exactly did this character, you know, as portrayed in many films, and this person become the famous w little girl? I, I do think that even though I have, you know, icky feelings about child stars overall, I can see the case that one of the things that's great about kids, probably the single most delightful thing about being a parent, is their innocence. Mm -hmm. It is a really heartwarming feeling to indulge in their imaginations and to just like how much they don't know yet. And that the atmosphere of that is really great. And Shirley Temple had that. And maybe we do need some version of that in our entertainment and in our art. Yeah, so you answered that in your own question about, like, why why, why did the nation need that in the height of the Great Depression? Yeah, and I, I don't think that that's bullshit. I think that that's real. And I think to this day we need that. I think we need Disney movies. I think we need Pixar. I think we need, you know, I've become a big fan of Studio Ghibli and Miyazaki lately. I mean, I, I, I want actually expressions of childhood innocence in pop culture and in art. And to make that art, you probably need kids. Yeah. What's the healthy way to do that as a society? I don't know. Yeah. But, hey, Pixar, but maybe. Need, yeah. Yeah. So this is a, a really good segue to, to the regret that I wanted to talk about, which is a private potential regret. Mm. You use the word innocence. Yeah. Right? So there were detractors about her act and her performance that it wasn't innocent that all of the outfits and the subtle curves and the little, and the flirty eyes yeah. was all like sexual bait. Masked pedophilia, latent pedophilia. Correct, and that, that's the reason yeah. that it was, that was a reason why it was so popular and so popular amongst a large group of, of audience. The movie going public, yeah. Yeah, I think all the studios vehemently deny it and everything, but... They're playing with that fire. Yeah, I wonder what she thought of that. But is and that was her there any regret? regret? But is that her regret? This gets back to the like. It the, is only if the sense of there was a deliberate thing that she was privy to. I think that there's a thing that she's privy to. It's not clear to me that she has any agency. And if she doesn't have any agency to make the decisions about her early career in her life, can it be a regret? At what point are you yeah, become responsible? Absolutely, you can be regretful that you did something and were used. Well, oh, that's interesting. So that, to me, makes me think about healthy regrets versus unhealthy regrets. Because does does regret have to be tethered to responsibility? I think you can have the emotion of regret for something you're not responsible for. Yeah. I think that happens a lot. But that's more trauma, I guess, than yeah, it is. Yeah, but I think it's important. Yeah. I think it's really important. And so if our definition of regret includes things that you may not be responsible for— Which it shouldn't. Which it shouldn't. It shouldn't. I guess that's the point I want to make, is that— Regrets should not include things that you didn't have that agency over. And if you're a child in yeah, Hollywood, so, so you know. maybe I'm expanding this category today to yeah. just to just include potential traumas. Yeah. All right. I feel like we covered that. Okay. Next category: good dreams, bad dreams. I went good. 
Yeah, I, I went good despite some evidence that was interesting. You used the word resilient, and I think that's very true about her. The case is against. There was obviously like this exposure yeah. that she had to witness as a child of men exposing herself. Pause on that, though, because that's super duper fucking common. I wish it wasn't. Is it? I think so. I remember being at this lunch one time in high school with these girls, and there was like 11 girls, and I was the one guy there. And I remember this one girl saying, this will always stick in my memory, is there anybody here at this table who has not been sexually abused or faced some sort of sexual assault? And not a single girl raised their hand. And that could be by an older man exposing himself to you as a child. Who knows? I think that... It's worse probably in Hollywood where there's all kinds of fucked up power dynamics and there's Harvey Weinstein is not the first monster that this industry has produced. But I don't think the pressure that girls face going through adolescence and into womanhood is by any means contained to Hollywood, right? I, I think that most girls and women deal with that full stop. I, I think it may have been harder for her because she's in more of an adult world. Yeah. But- but you're saying adolescence into womanhood. I think we're talking about single-digit childhood here. Uh, yeah, although the vibe I get from her autobiography is that that risk, somebody doing something inappropriate, was really mitigated until she got closer to puberty. That was one argument for bad dreams. The other one I had, again, goes back to Czechoslovakia. So mm. did you catch this story when she was there in 68? Yeah. She was there with like uh, for a multiple sclerosis. Yeah, um, it was like a fundraiser thing or something. Yeah, she yeah. must have been speaking, but that's when the Soviets invaded. Yes. So they had to flee to like the roof of their hotel. Because I don't know if the hotel was under siege. And she's on the roof of her hotel and she sees uh, a woman get gunned down. A protester, in, yeah. In the streets, like yeah. literally just watching, witnessing the death, the, yeah. the shooting. That's some hard things to see, obviously, our troops face that all the time, but civilians are kind of different too. I thought about that as a Malkovich moment, actually. Yeah. So that's that's just, you know, some of the cases of bad dreams, but I'm going back to resilience, like you said, and I think good dreams. All right. Second to last category, cocktail, coffee, or cannabis. This is where we ask, which one would we most want to do with our dead celebrity? This may be a question of what drug sounds like the most fun, or it may be that we're trying to unlock some you know, get access to some inner question that we're curious about. What do you got here? Definitely cannabis. Wow. With the adult, surely. Yeah. You know, with like post, uh, so, post Czech Republic. So would this be a joint, a bong hit, a pipe, you know, a vape? Probably. Well, that's an interesting one. Uh, I mean, a joint seems more more personal. You'd like to pass a joint <laughs> with Shirley Temple? Yeah. Her pass one to me, I think, actually. Yeah. Like, she goes first. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. And, it's and, you know, you talk about the access. Yeah. And that arc, I just want to see. I want to know about these all these questions I raised about childhood. Yeah. And I want to know how you fucking build resilience. You know, and she can tell it to me over coffee or a Shirley Temple Black. <laughs> but I think there would just be a certain insight and prophecy that perhaps can only be unlocked in that setting, in that in intimacy and with that substance. Yeah, that's good. I went coffee. I often do when I sense intelligence. And it's not actually that I'm so interested in the stories. I mean, I listed all those people, you know, who are, to me, distant figures of history who she had chance interactions with. I, I would love to interview her. The thing that I'm probably most curious about in an intellectual vein is how she understands the phenomenon of celebrity and the blending of entertainment and politics. I mean, she knew presidents. She knew Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt. She got to meet Truman. She was honored by Clinton. She worked with Nixon. She was appointed by, you know, Ford. So she she was at the upper echelons of American political culture. She was also at the upper echelons of American corporate culture, serving on the board and she, uh, of all these companies. And she's at the upper echelons of American entertainment culture. I want perspective on all those things. Yeah. I just want to sit down and, and like hear her talk about how she understands America. You yeah. know? Yeah. So, so that's, that's great. All right. We're here. Our final category. The Vanderbeek. Named after James Vanderbeek, who famously said in Varsity Blues, I don't want your life. Ahmed, do you want Shirley Temple's life? Or do you want me to go first? I have been going first a lot. So, yes, I want you to go first. So, one of the things I feel like I always have to remind myself is that the question of do I admire and like this person is different 
then the question of what would it be like to be this person? And it's that second question that we are interested in. Do I want to have been this person? First of all, I don't think I have the characteristics that she had. I think had I been a child actor, male or female, I would have been chewed up. Now, did she obtain resilience and authority and leadership skills as a consequence of that, or was she born with them? It's a nature-nurture question. So I don't know. I feel like I'm a lean yes for a lot of reasons. It's a really interesting life. It's a fascinating life. All those things I just talked about, all the people she meets, the historical figures, the time period she exists in, the, the immortalization in a non-alcoholic drink. Like There is so much I really, really like. And just learning about her was fucking fun and fascinating and great. I'm not sure I can separate those questions right now of do I like her versus would I want to be her. I'm a yes, but I'm sort of like struggling in my mind to make the case for what what a no would be. That she had to deal with sleazeballs and perverts and probably some really, really fucked up characters for all of her life. That makes me averse, but at the same time, I don't want to hide. And I don't think she did. So I see somebody who's courageous, smart, and somebody who is a leader and somebody who left an impact on the world in a lot of different ways. And even if those things aren't celebrated in the first line of her obituary, putting all that on the table, yes, I think I want this life. I said that as a grown man. <laughs> I will take your life, Shirley Temple. That felt good. That did, did I it? I feel like my inner child just got a little, you know, just got to say, just got to pipe up. That's good. Okay, uh, you great word, inner child. There's my hesitation, is that that was her childhood. There was no childhood that was anything like what you or I experienced. If I'm going to look back on my life, probably some of the best, most sound memories are like just playing in the pool with my brother in the summers when I'm like seven or eight years old. And she had none of that. Like she just had none, no pure childhood moments. And the things that you talk about with your children of the innocence, how excited they are to just like, roll around in the grass, you know, that she didn't get. I mean, I'm sure she had moments of it. You know, you talk about how good her parents were, at kind of like protecting her and guiding her and being real parents. But there's no doubt she just didn't have the opportunity to do that, given what that essentially she was a career person from the age of like four or five. So that's something that I am not sure about. Well, let me just hype it up in there. I don't want to interrupt too much, but she would say she had fun on set. She would. She okay. would describe her experiences of practicing lines with her mother the night before and entering this world of make-believe and working with the cast and crew and being a precocious child as positive memories. In fact, maybe the highlight of her childhood was actually working on the stage yeah. and working you know, with the cameras off or on. Like, I think it was exciting. I think all the stuff around it is a lot more complicated. So so maybe none of that is true. So may, maybe all I'm making in the case is the anonymity of playing in the pool with my brother, which allows me to be fully present and a presence that I haven't, you know, been able to recapture. Yeah. So that's the case against. But the words that have come up very often in this conversation are resilience. And I'm going to add the word pivot as well. Yeah. She seems incredibly resilient to that. I think the pivot to the rest of her career as a diplomat, a board member, a champion of causes, is absolutely remarkable. And if you book into meeting Albert Einstein to being the last ambassador to Czechoslovakia before it split into two nations, is extraordinary. Yeah. And she may live, her name may live on forever if that drink does, but the pivot and the resilience, the love, the good parent relationship, the husband that she did finally find, I didn't hear anything that would complicate that. Like you said, she spoke very articulately. So my answer is yes. I want your life, Shirley Temple. <laughs> sorry. I should have laughed. It still feels a little awkward. Sorry, sorry. I want your life, Shirley Temple Black. I think you do the pearly gates. Oh, wow. Okay. Can I tap dance my way? No, <laughs> but I, 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 now I get to prompt, right? I get to yeah, be yeah, yeah, the yeah. MC here. 
Uh, okay, Michael, you are Shirley Temple. Yes. Uh, you are entering the afterlife. You are before St. Peter, who is a stand-in for um, the gateway to any afterlife, regardless of your belief. Make your case. Peter. Shirley. <laughs> Don't call me Shirley. You made yourself laugh. <laughs> just, 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 I just, uh, that, just that was, I'm imagining Peter saying, Shirley, you can't be serious. I know, but that was inner child laughter. Good job, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. It's authentic. Uh, so I had a complicated life in a way. I was a child star and maybe the first and in some ways the most important child star. And I brought people a tremendous amount of joy at a time when culture needed that. I'm proud of that, but I'm not sure whether or not it's right for me to take responsibility for it. I do think it's appropriate for me to take responsibility for the decisions I made as a woman, for my commitment to political causes, for my efforts to bring equal rights to women in a variety of institutions, whether that's in corporate leadership or in political leadership or around health issues. I discovered in my life that the more I gave back, the more possibilities opened up to me. So I'm very grateful for the opportunities I was given, and I tried my best to give them back at every turn. So for my experiences in Hollywood, for my public service, and really for everything I did, let me in. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Famous and Gravy. If you're enjoying our show, please go to Apple Podcasts to rate and review us. It really does help new listeners to find the show. We would love to see you on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Famous and Gravy. We've got lots of fun stuff there on our Twitter feed. Also, please sign up for our newsletter on our website, FamousAndGravy.com. Famous and Gravy was created by Amit Kapoor and me, Michael Osborne. This episode was produced by Morgan Honecker. Original theme music by Kevin Strang. And thanks also to our sponsor, Half Price Books. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.